Buenas tardes. So, I'll talk a little bit about how I ended up in open hardware and what I've been doing and what can what I think is uh, interesting for us also to discuss being here together. Uh, what brought me to open harder? My background, very different. Uh, I'm in physics, nuclear reactions, material analysis, semiconductor technology, very close field. If you go to IMB physics, it's close to nuclear physics, using nuclear reactions. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of that, uh, of that. They don't want to talk about it. And material for semiconductor technology is on, on our phones, our computers, very close. You won't learn what's going on inside your phone, inside your computer. You can use it, but you don't have access to the information, how it was built, the materials inside, the process, very close. Uh, so I started with, with a very different background. Uh, and what I'm going to show here is not a, a, a series of uh, like a linear thought that put me in open hardware, but something that made me think about what I'm doing and how should I uh, spend my energy. And I realized that something is wrong. Something is wrong. Uh, I was talking with the society models, models of production and consumption. And one reference for this is uh, a book called Limits to Growth that was published in the 70s by a group called the Club of, Club, Club of Rome that they were studying the limits of the ecosystems, uh, increasing economic, uh, uh, economic production, extraction of materials, uh, uh, environmental uh, problems related to that. And this is one, one, one of the things that I was reading 10 years ago, like when I was finished my PhD. We are living in the age of stupid. <laughs> this is a documentary from 2009 that also I watched at the time. That's interesting. If you are interested, it's still relevant today, maybe even more. It shows how we are seeing stuff, we are getting data, and very little is being done. Even knowing that things are not doing well. So, this is the week page on Wikipedia. You can find somewhere this documentary. Uh, and we are still leaving some problems. I'm, I don't have the solution to this problem, but I, I believe that we are, what we are discussing, uh, the culture we are building, uh, may be able to tell, uh, tackle this, uh, this problem. Uh, this is very new, this is from 11 March like two weeks ago, and it's a long problem. And I think it's relevant that we may be able to, science may be able to tackle the solutions, to start looking to this, because general science don't care about it. It's just doing the same stuff, publishing in high-impact papers, and, and working. Uh, so, how to better use my experience? I have experience on I'm doing physics, semiconductor technology. How about working on green energy? I spent one or two years uh, looking for photovoltaics, a little bit of hydrogen research, green energy. Okay, nice. It's close to what I was doing. Uh, however, the research, uh, production, distribution chain. Uh, it's not really prepared. Uh, it's not really prepared for relevant change on uh, what is needed. We are just going to change the energy source and keep doing the same thing. So the energy is not exactly the only problem. Is what we are doing with this problem? We what we are doing with this energy? 
So let's go down the rabbit hole a little bit. And uh, Daniela Measles, that's one of the authors, uh, uh, authors of Limits to Growth. She wrote uh, a piece called 12 Leverage Points to Intervene in a System, in a system in crisis. And the most important one, that's the number one, is the mindset or paradigm of which we of which the rules of which the system arises. That's the real shift in mindset, the paradigm change. And that's what we are doing open hearted. So like things got together and I decided to start pushing on this direction to change really deeper on the system that I believe we are doing all we are all doing here. Uh, so I started a center for open technology at the university, the center for academic technology. Academic technology, in my mind, should be open. So that's a tricky uh, game of words, academic technology, so that at the university you can study, the students can study, uh, start business with the open technology, and so on. And it was started in 2012. We're focusing on free software, uh, open hardware, open science, open educational resources for uh, engineering students, for future teachers, professors, like uh, even technology for inside the, the, the academia. So my question was how how to bring change? If you see uh, what happened to free software? How will the free software movement grew? It was from a solid foundation based on three, uh, two main issues. Uh, a text editor. This started in the 80s. How the free software movement that's, can be an inspiration for us. It is a success. So in the, in the 80s, it was developed. Uh, a C compiler, a code compiler, so that you could translate code, written text code, to a binary file that you can execute in the computer. The text editor itself was free software, so people could share the tools to write the software and the license. This was written in the middle of the 80s. And from this foundation, the whole free software movement grew. And we need something like this to have a, a thriving open hardware community. Because we have seen a lot of projects, very exciting projects, but how can we work together on them? How can we share the designs and make improvements on each other projects? I think this is uh, very important for us to discuss. So. Uh, I'm using the privilege of being here to expose this, uh, this suggestion for us to discuss more about this. Like the GNU project, what they did in the 80s, we should do something in the 2010s. Uh, not only the tools, also the how to organize the community, how to get tasks and assignments as responsibilities. So this is on some posters that we have outside. We are talking about this organ how to organize community. An example, uh, KiCad is one of the softwares used for designing uh, electronic circuits and circuit boards. So it's getting huge improvements from uh, recent years from certain contributions and several collaborative efforts to improve the software. Uh, we use also a, a concept called hyper, hyper objects, where we have tools or hardware that's entirely designed on open uh, free software. The documentation is all open and uh, everything is open around it because we can use open hardware we can, use, uh, we can use proprietary software to write open hardware, but then it may be difficult to share the, uh, the designs uh, and make it usable 
to others. We designed some PCB machines, uh, CNC milling machines. This is João de Barco PCB milling machine, the first version, the second prototype that's being sold uh, is being sold by Germano on, a, on this company. It's a student that works at the center, and now he's selling this machine. It's easier for him to, to sell it as closed source, where he don't tell that it's open source. When he says that it's open source, people think that it should be much cheaper, because this is a high quality machine, but they are expecting to pay a few bucks only, because the, there is an association with open source being cheap, and then we have a problem, and a cultural problem. The modular wireless station that uh, Leonardo uh, is showing is his master's uh, subject now. And some inspirations that I think it's important to say during these last years. Uh, Mahatma uh, Gandhi that says something that people translate as PG change we want to see in the world. So I use free software, I look to develop open hardware, promote open science. And also non-violence, Martin Luther King Jr. said how uh, non-violence is a powerful and just weapon. And I think changing the, uh, the paradigm is a way of non-violence. To use non-violence in the academia, we are not fighting against anyone, but we are just uh, changing really a, a, a mindset. And thank you very much.